Welcome back to the Sunshine State and to the 75th anniversary meeting of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. I'm Montria Godfrey. Yesterday we focused on the many accomplishments that the Academy has made over the past 75 years. Today we are looking ahead to the future of forensic science. From our sit-down interviews with those in the cutting-edge field of forensic nursing to the ways the Young Forensic Scientists Forum is supporting the next generation of scientists, today's episode will highlight what the future holds. We also pick up our tour around the globe of those institutions utilizing fascinating new ways to move the forensic needle forward. In case you're wondering where to watch, you can always find the latest AAFS TV episode on any of the TV monitors scattered throughout the conference center. You can also find us on our dedicated spot on the AAFS website, in-house channel 137 here at the Shingle Creek Resort, and of course you can always see all of our interviews and clips on our YouTube and Twitter pages. We begin today with a new frontier in the forensic science arena, forensic nursing. Described as the link between the healthcare system and the law, and forensic nurse Julie Valentine joins us here in studio. Thanks for your time. Thank you for having me. So let's get started with, for people who are unfamiliar, how do you describe forensic nursing? What do you tell people you do? Forensic nursing is caring for individuals who have been impacted by violence or trauma. So it extends everything from sexual assault, child abuse, elder abuse, to uh, traumatic events such as the earthquake in Turkey and Syria. Fascinating. Um, would you describe yourself as more forensic scientist or more nurse? Definitely describe myself as more nurse. Uh, nursing has a very holistic approach as to how we care for victims, our patients, and so when we are caring for these individuals impacted by trauma, we look at all the aspects of how this trauma has impacted their life. Part of that is the forensic aspect. I think when people think of forensic nursing, their first thought is to think of, you know, administering the kits to maybe a sexual assault victim. How do you utilize forensic nursing when it comes to, like you mentioned, those earthquake victims in Turkey? So forensic nursing, the majority of forensic nurses are sexual assault nurse examiners, and it actually has been around for 30 years, forensic nursing. Um, but it also encompasses psych mental health, uh, expertise in trauma-informed care. And uh, so it, it goes across the board, and we also care for people across the lifespan. We talked about forensic nursing is sometimes described as, you know, where forensic science meets the law. How important is the data that you gather in a hospital setting when it comes to the courtroom? So the forensic information or evidence that we collect from a victim, the importance can vary. I have cared for some patients where the evidence that I collected was the game changer. That helped to identify the perpetrator or it really was necessary for that crime to be charged and then move forward throughout the process. But we have to consider that generally it's part of the puzzle piece of looking at what happened in a crime. It really is using science to inform criminal justice. I would think that's very fulfilling for you as a nurse to see, you know, you, you, obviously you take care physically of the patient when they arrive, but then to be able to see, you know, the end of their case all the way through fruition, see that perpetrator be held accountable, you know that that is also treating their mental health aspect as well. That has to be very fulfilling. It is, it's fulfilling to see those cases move forward the sad part is that we, in terms of rape, see very few of those cases prosecuted, even when evidence collected. And that's an area that we need renewed focus on. You were a nurse for a very long time before you got into the forensics nursing arena. Um, what was it about that that it was attractive to you? Why did you want to pivot from traditional nursing? Well, I think healthcare and forensics have some commonalities. They both are using science and evidence to provide the best care to develop evidence-based uh, practice guidelines. I was intrigued as an old ICU nurse as to the science and the rapidly changing technology and developments. And also I felt very compassionate towards these survivors of trauma and felt that I have this time in my life 
for me to care for patients, and I can probably make more of a difference caring for these individuals impacted by trauma than anywhere else. Final question for you. Um, biggest obstacle or challenge that you face in this field? Biggest obstacle or, and, or challenge is not enough forensic nurses. Uh, we need many more forensic nurses. Every hospital needs a forensic nurse. We may, need more education in forensic nursing. I'm talking about traditional uh, nursing programs, not just specialty forensic nursing programs. But forensic nurses are educated in how to best care for these victims of violence and trauma and to collect the best evidence. And so uh, we need more. You mentioned that forensic nursing has actually been around for quite a while, a long time, but it is just finally being recognized, you know, as a section of the AAFS. That has to be, that has to feel good. Absolutely, it shows the growth of forensic nursing and it also validates the importance of forensic nursing. Well, the work you do is very important and so we certainly appreciate it, thank you. For people who might experience violence at any point in their lives, their experience with a forensic nurse will be a defining one. The Texas A&M Health Center of Excellence in Forensic Nursing was established to provide support and health care for the patient, as well as fulfill an essential role in the legal process. The mission of the Center of Excellence for Forensic Nursing at Texas A&M University is to educate nurses to provide specialized care to patients following trauma, to engage in scholarship and research that advances forensic nursing science and practice, and to provide outreach to communities so that they can better care for their community members who've been impacted by violence. The continuing education has exploded with the different types of simulations that we've been able to develop through funding through the Health Resources Services Administration, or HRSA. Our ultimate aim is to ensure that their healing journey is begun in a way that promotes their optimal health outcomes. So after receiving care from a nurse who's received specialized training, we hope that they leave feeling supported, safe, and able to begin their healing journeys. James Gill, Connecticut's chief medical examiner, just recently discussed the future of forensic pathology and primarily the need for more bodies, live ones. He is stopping by the studio this morning to explain. Thanks for your time today. Thank you for having me. Let's talk a little bit about the current state of affairs. You recently gave an interview about the current state of medical examiners and coroner's offices all across the country and the need for more bodies. Like I said, is this a lack of funding issue coupled with the shortage of forensic pathologists? It is a combination. Uh, I think the main problem is a shortage in the workforce. Uh, there are just that, not that many forensic pathologists out there. Uh, there are few, about 500 or 600 board certified uh, practicing forensic pathologists that are working. And if all the jurisdictions in the country were covered by a forensic pathologist, we would need 12 to 1500. Oh, wow. So there's a big shortage and that's gonna then affect problems with uh, doing autopsies and uh, issuing reports and death certificates. That was gonna be my next question. So this is now creating a backlog in those autopsies, the final reports. Typically, what is the timeline for getting those things completed? Kind of the professional guidelines are having your reports, 90% uh, of your reports done within 60 days. Now, the reason is, one is for families, right? Families are waiting for uh, death certificates so they can get uh, life insurance benefits, uh, and they're waiting for the remains so they can have their funerals. So there's a delay in some offices with performing autopsies. Uh, we saw a problem in one state where there were over 200 bodies waiting for autopsies wow. to be done. So you can imagine the anguish that causes the families. Right. Plus law enforcement, uh, they're investigating cases and so forth, and so that's gonna interfere with, with their work. So what do we do? How do we, how do we fix this? Uh, you know, funding is an issue. We're trying to encourage more people to go into forensic pathology. Uh, salaries are actually increasing because of the shortage, uh, and we're working on some things like loan forgiveness, student loan forgiveness, oh, okay. uh, to encourage uh, those residents in pathology to come into forensic pathology because it's a it's a really exciting uh, field. It's something different every day. You never know what you're going to see. So hopefully, uh, you know. Uh, they'll get the message. You know, you would think that shows like CSI would be doing a little bit more to pique the interest of this next generation and get them involved in forensic science. I think it has actually helped. Uh, okay. 
so people know what we do. It's not quite exactly what we do, <laughs> but at least gets their foot in the door, right? right? So then uh, they can come and we say, come and spend a day with us and, and really see what it's like. Uh, and some people say, it's not for me. Other people say, I love this. Sign me up. Yeah. So what do you see as the future of medical legal death investigations if the current situation holds? Well, the problem is quality of our, our data, right? Uh, so a lot of our uh, information goes to the public health. Um, you know, if you want to improve the health of people, you want to know why they're dying. Uh, and death certificates actually save lives. Uh, and so uh, without that workforce, uh, autopsies aren't going to be done or quality autopsies aren't going to be done. Uh, turnaround times are going to be delayed. Families are going to be waiting. Police are going to be waiting. The public health data is going to not be as good quality. Uh, so th those are some of the, the big ones. You know, you mentioned it's a, an industry that's already strained. You're already cash strapped and you, there's a shortage of people. I would imagine that the COVID-19 pandemic only made matters worse. Yeah, we we're kind of one areas, uh, one of the areas in medicine that, that still had to work, right? I, right? I mean, obstetricians and people working in the ICU uh, all had to work. So did medical examiners and coroners yeah. because our, our job doesn't stop. Unbelievable. All right, let's talk about some of the advancements that you've seen during your years um, in pathology. Um, are you able to examine or autopsy in a way now that you never dreamt of? Yeah, I think there are two great advances that we've seen in the last couple uh, you know, decades. One is in imaging. So more and more offices are using CAT scanners, uh, which uh, can improve efficiency, maybe even uh, help with our autopsy issues. Uh, the other thing it does is it's, it's great documentation. And part of our work, we really want to make sure that we document all the injuries and so someone else can look at them and see what we saw. The other area is with uh, DNA and molecular testing. And I'm not talking about just for identification, but actually for disease. So now we can start looking uh, in our decedents uh, to see if they have a, um, uh, a hereditary disease, maybe a heart condition that caused their death that we weren't able to diagnose 20 years ago. Fascinating, interesting. All right, last question for you here. Finish this sentence. The future of forensic pathology is? Bright. Uh, I, I think that we are getting more people interested in the field. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful field. Uh, you, 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 you see something, again, different every day. You're dealing with families, police, law enforcement, you're teaching. Uh, and so I, I'm very, uh, my outlook is very positive about forensic pathology. It's just gonna take a little time to get Well, you're a great ambassador for it. So thank you very much for all your work. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. There is one particular group within the Academy aimed at invigorating the next generation of forensic scientists. And Zane Balu is the chair of the Young Forensic Scientists Forum and joins us this morning to explain a little bit more. Good morning. Good morning. All right, let's talk about this group. How did it form? What's the purpose? Well, it formed quite some time ago. I actually became the chair of this group at its 25th anniversary. So now we're into the 29th or so-ish. Um, and its main purpose, I guess, it gives new Academy attendees and international attendees a place to congregate and to exchange information. It's a really low pressure environment where they can network with each other and network with people who are, you know, big names in their field, big names at the big names at the academy. And it gathers them to be able to share information, benefit from information, and we, we do a lot of work to tailor the information to this group. So. so these are people who are already working within the forensic science community and maybe they would like to take their career to the next level or they're looking for that next jump. Absolutely, and actually it, it does vary quite a bit. So we have people who are not in their field at all. There are people who are wanting to get into the field. There are people who are in the field, just in the wrong field. So this really gives them an opportunity to see what the academy has to offer as well as the forensic sciences gives them an opportunity to make sure that, you know, if this is the field they want to be in, they can move forward. If it's a field that they're adjacent to, they can move sideways. If it's a field that they just don't want to be in, they can they can choose something else. And I've, I've heard of that before where people just say, you know what, I thought this was for me and I'm glad I did this because it turns out it's not. So, Obviously, this conference here is an, an amazing networking opportunity for folks within this forum. What are the other opportunities uh, for attendees or for members of this group throughout the year? So we do have a couple of, um, I'm also part of a group called the uh, Global Collaboration of Forensic Scientists and we put on webinars throughout the year so there's a lot of opportunities to keep up to date, to touch base, to, you know, to keep your finger on the pulse of the academy and as well as the forensic science. Um, we do offer you know, other opportunities within the academy to give back to the academy as well. So all the, all the whole way throughout the year we're making sure that 
attendees have the information that they need about what's coming up, what they would like to see. We actually do quite a bit of back and forth with them. You know, what would you like to see? What did you like about it last year? And you know, what can we do to make the, the session better? How do you recruit? How do you build up membership? Well, and in fact, there's actually no specific recruitment process. We, we're more of an attendance ship rather than a membership. And our main goal is to provide uh, you know, the best quality speakers and the best quality information to these attendees. So we target more of the information and that brings in the attendance ship. These people are, like I said, in various walks of life. So bringing them here with valuable information will get them here and then they get to benefit from the rest of the academy and the rest of the meeting. How vital are these different groups and this forum in particular to the younger generations of forensic scientists? Oh, well, we could do a whole interview on just that, <laughs> on just that question. 20 uh, minutes. Yeah, I know, yeah. Um, well, it, 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 it's invaluable. I mean, you know, we're, we're actually at a point in time, I feel like, where things have gone remote. I mean, doctor's appointments, you know, family appointments, you know, personal lives, everything's gone remote. I have always been of the opinion that being hands-on and being immersed in something is a lot more valuable than reading about it and you know, and, and, and getting your information from a piece of paper or, or, or a computer screen. Here we provide the opportunity to meet people, to network, to, you know, to gather bits and pieces of information that you would otherwise miss if you're watching it on a screen. So I think it's completely invaluable. And you're the one, as the chair of this forum, you're the one talking with this fo these folks you know, on a regular basis. Is that feedback that you've heard from them that there was a real disconnect during the, the pandemic when everything went virtual and they're really clamoring for that face-to-face -face networking again? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I don't remember the exact number, but I believe it was in the 200s for the online attendance, which was a bump up from the year before. I think it actually, in some ways, did us a service because more people got exposed to it, being that it was online, they could access it. When they accessed it, now they can come and they go, hey, I've, I participated in this last time. Um, I want to take part in it again. So we actually, I interestingly found out this year that we had to cap registration for our, our session. They gave us the biggest room they possibly could because there were so many registrants that they, they had to give us a bigger room. and they could not let any, anybody else in, so. That's great, the yeah. best kind of problem to have. Absolutely, yeah, that's, <laughs> those are the kinds of problems we hope for. Okay, so not that you need to encourage more attendance, but for somebody who may be watching this who had not heard of the forum before and they're now interested, how might they get involved? Oh, uh, you know, I've always said that, you know, going to the meeting will give you exposure, becoming a member will give you experience, and joining up and becoming a part of it will give you a sense of merit and a sense of, you know, uh, ownership, as it were, of, you know, as part, as part of uh, the academy. Uh, I would say, you know what, join a committee, volunteer, get your face out there as well as your name. Uh, you know, your, your best asset is who you are, not, not just what you can do. So come in, volunteer your time. I'm part of a couple of different committees, but I started out just with the Young Forensic Scientists Forum and I started out as an attendee in my first meeting and from there it just sort of took off, so. Well, great, congratulations, Thank appreciate you. it. All right, thanks for your time today. Thank you very much.